Mora conducts physician-led support groups, helping people live healthier, happier lives, free from chronic diseases like diabetes, hypertension, and obesity. And on our podcast, Health and Mora with Dr. Lori Marbus, we bring to you nutrition and lifestyle medicine experts and extraordinary guests to empower and inspire you with their knowledge and stories of plant-based lifestyle so that you can be your healthiest self. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the podcast. And we are back with another amazing physician, Dr. Rizwan Bukhari. Dr. Riz, how are you today? I'm good. Thank you very much for having me. Ah, thank you for coming. I'm really excited. Um, well, we've known each other for a little bit, and you are in the heart of Texas. And so I can't wait to hear how this plant-based story evolves literally in some of the, I think, the hardest communities <laughs> to go plant-based um, would be Texas. So can we hear a little bit? First, let's just talk about why you even wanted to become a doctor and how that story evolved, and then we'll, we'll, get, we'll get into the other. Well, uh, so, well uh, so I am a uh, first-generation American. Uh, my parents came over in the 60s. My dad is also a, a, was also a, a vascular surgeon. He's passed away a few years ago. Uh, but he had come over to do his uh, training in surgery. And uh, so I, I was born here. And as a first-generation American, there's often these expectations that you're going to excel. Or, or, and the son of a doctor, he, you're going to become a doctor. So there was always this kind of thing in the background as I was growing up. Uh, and, you know, I was a pretty studious kid as, uh, uh, and, you know, did well in school. And uh, so even by the time I got to college, there was this kind of this expectation. Now, mm -hmm. funny enough, uh, I got to college, uh, university around the time that computers were starting to become a big deal. Back in the late 80s, uh, uh, Apple computer was there, the uh, PC was there, and I had a strong interest in computers. So I kind of Thumbed, you know, my, uh, uh, thumbed my dad by saying, hey, no, I'm not going to be pre-med. I'm going to go uh, computer science. And so I was computer science major for about a semester uh, before I, you know, really just did decide that uh, I, I didn't want to go into medicine. So I became a pre-med guy and, uh, and uh, later, later on in college and then uh, went on from there. And it was always this kind of thing where, uh, yeah, I guess I am my father's son. There's some characteristics of a surgeon. You know, I'm pretty obsessive compulsive, which is good, you know, uh, when you, if you want to be a surgeon. And, uh, and uh, I enjoyed the, the concept of uh, where if I did something, it made a difference immediately. Uh, mm -hmm. Surgeons kind of enjoy that, cutting out disease or fixing something. Mm -hmm. And so I enjoyed that concept. So I did I naturally evolve into surgery. And then, then the next natural step was to follow in my father's footsteps, and I became a vascular surgeon. So, uh, and then I came back to Dallas. Uh, this is where da my dad had done his vascular surgery training, uh, and this is where he had settled down. And so I came back to Dallas in the late 90s and joined him. Mm. So can, can we just talk a little bit about, you just kind of skipped, oh, I just did a surgery, and then I did vascular, oh, yeah. So let's talk about what the intensity here is. Because <laughs> I need, could you describe, so this is, you go to college, you go to medical school, so that's eight years. And now we're talking your post-medical school education. Could you share with us what the number of years and what that entails? Because I, I really want people to appreciate what you've done. Well, well sure, <laughs> sure. Thank that. you. Yeah, you know, so general surgery, the, the pathway to uh, a specialist is you have to do general surgery first. So I did five years of general surgery. And, and if you want to, uh, yeah, if you want to specialize, it's pretty competitive and, and you have to do well. Uh, it, it, and that's kind of the way it is at every step of the game is if you want to go to the next step, you have to continue doing well. Uh, so then I did a two-year fellowship in vascular surgery. Uh, oh. and, and so seven years. Uh, so I, you know, the med uh, my medical education was uh, four years of med school, five years of general surgery, and two years of vascular. Oh, my goodness. And just to compare, so I had four years of medical school and three years of family medicine residency, and then I'm done. <laughs> but you, you continued double that. So it's an incredible. Um, but then you also did some additional training in minimally uh, invasive technique, correct? Well, yeah, actually. So yeah, let me clarify. Back back when I did vascular, there was a one-year fellowship and a two-year fellowship. Ah. Uh, and the one-year fellowship was a more straightforward, just a surgical fellowship. Okay. Uh, and so when you when you finished uh, as a vascular surgeon, you just had those that skill set to operate. Um, and I chose to go to one of the few places in the country that was a two-year fellowship because mm -hmm. they had incorporated some of the newer uh, cutting-edge technologies in minimally invasive vascular stuff. Oh, cool. Um, I, I had, uh, I, I get, you know, our, our mentors are everything in our lives, and I had some very good guidance 
uh, and one of my mentors had kind of, you know, when when we were sitting around and talking about should I do one year or should I two two years, and you know, by the time you're in your mid thirties or early thirties, eh, you know, you can you go, know, gosh, do I really want to do another year, um, or do I just want to finish and finally start making a living? Uh, but he had said, no, go do the two years. Uh, you're still young, and uh, it, uh, you'll appreciate the new technologies that you're learning. And it'll prepare you for the rest of your career. Mm -hmm. And he was absolutely right. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, one of those mentors was my dad, but I had other people who were helping me. And so I chose to do the two-year fellowships where I learned some of the, some of the newer cutting-edge technologies. And, and, and that just allowed me to get the foot in the door back in the late 90s because things have just changed tremendously in the last two and a half decades. Oh, uh, and if I, hadn't done, if I hadn't done that training, I would have been so far behind. Yeah. Wow. So it, always wow. it always allowed me to take the next step and, do, and take on the next technology and the new developments that were coming in. Wow, that's incredible. How one decision um, set the groundwork for some amazing stuff. Awesome. Yeah. Isn't that often the case in life? Oh, right. yes. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Um, could you tell us a little bit about what a vascular surgeon does? Because I have not interviewed a vascular surgeon on here before, so I'd love for you to kind of go into depth, and which I think will well, lead naturally to some conversations about other things. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So there's not a lot of vascular surgeons, and then there's even less plant-based vascular surgeon. Uh, <laughs> I think you're uh, the only vascular, are you the only plant-based vascular surgeon? I may be the only one I know. Of. <laughs> I, I, I've heard, I've heard rumors of somebody in Alabama or something like that, but Alabama. Cer certainly not someone who's uh, uh, pretty vocal and out there, but wow. so a, a vascular surgeon is, um, is uh, a surgeon who uh, operates and treats uh, diseases of the blood vessels, which would be the arteries, veins, and lymphatics everywhere in the body except the heart and except the brain. Mm. And so the, the heart surgeon and the cardiologist treat the heart uh, and the neurosurgeon would treat the stuff inside the brain. So I take care of everything else. Mm. Uh, and so that might mean uh, a carotid artery for someone who's had a stroke or an, an aneurysm in the belly um, or blockages in the leg arteries uh, for someone who has gangrene or you know, might be losing their leg or has leg pain. And then also I treat uh, disorders of the veins and lymphatics for people who have varicose veins and, uh, and, lymph, uh, and leg swelling. And then, I mean, I, that's the kind of the gamut of what a vascular surgeon treats. Many of us then focus our time and, and subspecialize in things. Uh, and my, my area of focus is limb salvage. So mm. the majority of the work, I'd say about 70% of the work I do has to do with the lower extremities, the legs, um, and uh, cleaning out arteries, bypassing arteries, trying to save people's legs. Mm. So the, the, rest might, the rest might be an aneurysm in the belly or a carotid artery surgery or something like that. What percentage of your patients are diabetics? A very high percentage. So mm. all of my patients are, are very sick uh, in the sense that they all have chronic disease uh, because it's a constellation of chronic diseases that leads to atherosclerosis. Uh, and so uh, it it's... Uh, I don't think it's a stretching the truth if I'd say, you know, at least 50% are mm -hmm. diabetic, maybe more. Mm -hmm. Every single patient who walks in my door has either diabetes or hypertension or hypercholesterolemia or some combination of those things. Mm. And so can we, can you help us describe like, what is the basis of atherosclerosis and what are those changes? Like how many years does it take? Is it, and then what maybe are some symptoms that people could be not even realize that it's a, you know, a vascular issue. Right, right. So atherosclerosis uh, means hardening of the arteries. Um, athero means artery and sclerosis means hardening. Uh, and that's uh, uh, basically the atherosclerosis, the medical term for the deposition of plaque into the arterial wall. Uh, and as that plaque gets thicker and thicker, uh, it narrows down the opening of the artery and restricts blood flow. And so whatever that artery is supplying is then affected by uh, the blood flow. So uh, atherosclerosis is kind of a slow, indolent, insidious disease. It starts when we're very young, uh, and, but it doesn't have impact in our lives until we're older because it's uh, like sludge building up on the inside of a, uh, a pipe. At first, a little bit of sludge isn't going to slow the flow down, but as more and more and more builds up, you kind of reach a critical point where the pipes get clogged up. Uh, and so, uh, you know, it's, uh, we used to, we used to kind of characterize it as a disease of older people. Uh, and that's because that's the ones who get treated. Uh, but it is a disease that starts when we're very young. 
and I like to talk about this because, uh, you know, in educating people about their lifestyles and how you can make changes, uh, I want them to understand it starts when they're young. And so if they make those changes when they're young, they can affect the impact, the long-term impact. So, mm -hmm. you know, there's a, uh, a and, and, and a lot of this wasn't really taught to me in my fellowship. A lot of this was stuff I learned afterwards. And when I started to learn about lifestyle uh, and its impact on, uh, on chronic diseases, uh, but uh, one thing I learned about was a, a study done on Korean War vets who had been killed in action. You may know this study. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, uh, darn near 80% of the, these vets had beginnings of atherosclerosis in their arteries. What, and these were, these were autopsies done on Korean War vets killed in action. Uh, and and the, the surprising thing about that 80% is that the average age was 22 years old. Wow. And so what we learned from that study is that atherosclerosis is present by the time you're 22. Uh, and, and, it, and of course, these were called what we call fatty streaks in the beginnings, but that's where the disease begins. So it's starting back in our 20s. At that point, that's what we thought. Now, if you fast, that's in the 1950s, because that's when the Korean War was. And actually, you know, I, I, I like to make this point is that our diet wasn't that bad back then. Uh, <laughs> yeah, okay. If you fast forward 70 years now to where we are today, our diet is so much worse as a, as a society than it was then. So uh, if, if they were getting disease in their 20s back then, think about what people are getting today. And, and that has been confirmed uh, in various ways. Uh, there's been some autopsies on prepubescent kids who were killed for one reason or another, and it, they, they're, we're seeing fatty streaks in them. Uh, and then I, I learned something from a colleague of mine. She's a maternal fetal medicine specialist, MFM. She's from Houston, and she was giving a lecture one time at something that we were both talking at. And she talked about how they're, uh, they're seeing fatty streaks in utero. And so basically the child is beginning, uh, in, in, while the woman's pregnant, is getting fatty streaks based on the, the diet of the woman. Oh so, my goodness. Uh, and, and this is reflected in what I see in that when I started my practice back in the, uh, uh, in the 90s, uh, the, the average age of my patients was in the 60s and 70s. And uh, now you fast forward 25 years, and it's not unusual for me to see patients in their uh, 50s uh, and 40s. I've even treated, treated people in their 20s. And I'd wow. say the average age has decreased by nearly a decade wow. in just the 25 years I've practicing. Wow. So I'd say the average age of my patients is now in their early 60s. Oh, my goodness. You know, it's, uh, it's so curious that you said that as you were talking about these younger generation we had spoke to a cardiologist also in the Dallas area, and he mentioned that his youngest patient that he actually cathed was 22 years old. Mm. Oh my goodness. Yeah. yeah. I, I can distinctly remember a 28 year old who I, who I had to treat. Wow. Uh, and she, uh, you know, she had uh, been afflicted with juvenile diabetes. So wow. she was uh, already behind the eight ball, but she was also very non-compliant in her lifestyle in treating her diabetes. And then wow. she developed uh, hypertension and uh, a constellation of diseases. And before you knew it, at 28, she had uh, limb-threatening. I remember her very distinctly. This was a decade ago. But limb-threatening uh, issues with both, both her hands and her feet. Oh, my goodness. Oh, um, yeah, I think my youngest patient that I ever diagnosed with type 2 diabetes was 13. Wow. Yeah. So, because if you look at our kids now, 20% of the, you know, children under the age of 18 are overweight or obese. Mm -hmm. And it's just, it's disheartening and concerning. And then I can't remember how long ago it was. It wasn't that long ago. There was a study in, you know, just outside of diabetes, but cancer. So if you look at rectal and colon cancer, the highest risk age group is 18 to 35. Yeah. You know, I, and I just highlighted that and took notes on it, uh, a study that was done recently that shows that cancer is occurring in younger and younger people now, uh, oh. uh, colon cancer. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I mean, it's just, it's uh, unfathomable to think about because, I mean, it's just, yeah, it's, 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 it's a sad situation. And also um, other diseases like osteoporosis, we always think of this as a disease of menopause. And it's like, no, actually, we need to be discussing bone health and, and children, right? Because that's where those stores are laid up. By the time you're 30, you're done. The door, the doors are closed for the most part, you know, at least per the current research. Um, right. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I think many people think of these things as a disease at 
is of that person of that age, but they don't mm -hmm. realize that it started a right. long, long time. The building blocks or the foundation of it started a long time ago yeah. uh, in, in our habits and, and the way we treat ourselves when we're younger. Absolutely. I always tell patients when they, when we diagnose with diabetes, like, listen, I was like, you invested decades to get here. And mm -hmm. so let's, you know, and then they, they're like ready to change, but like they expect it to happen quickly, which it can happen very quickly. Um, but, you know, there's still maybe, we may not be able to get them to the, the optimal health, but at least we'll get them in a healthier state. It's a, it's a complicated issue with um, different patients, but. Um, agreed, agreed. You know, my, yeah. again, my, by the time they get to me, their yeah. arteries are so bad, uh, you know, lifestyle changes uh, aren't going to make the gangrene go away or the stroke right. go away. And right. so they do need, uh, oftentimes continue to need the, the intervention or treatment that I can provide for them uh, yeah. as an emergency stopgap measure. Uh, and I do call it filling, filling holes and putting out fires. Uh, and, <laughs> but uh, th that's what I'm doing. And, and so the, then the real change I talk to them about is, you know, start changing your lifestyle very, and very much, very, very central. That is the nutrition. Mm -hmm. And, uh, uh, and, but, you know, we talk about the other things, but nutrition is very focal, focal to that and, and exercise and other aspects of life. But, you know, yeah, it's not going to make that disease turn around and reverse and go running away right away, mm -hmm. but it does make them uh, healthier. Mm -hmm. uh, and even my patients before I operate on them, I tell them if you can change your lifestyle before I operate on you, you're going to be in a better place. Uh, and and be better health and have less complications. So mm -hmm. for for me, making those changes is important uh, at any at any age in life. Mm. Yeah, because it's going to help the healing. It decreases inflammation and halts progression, most likely yes. of the disease. One hundred percent. Well so, said. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, but I would love to, since we kind of skirted around the lifestyle interventions already. How did you become interested in plant-based eating or plant-based nutrition and lifestyle medicine. Love to hear that transition. So, you know, I've always been very uh, focused on my, my personal fitness and, but I had this kind of uh, uh, same thing that most Americans do thinking that fitness and health were mostly related to exercise. So for all of my life, I've been a, a big time runner, um, weightlifting since I was in, uh, in high school and, and running you know, I used to run 30 miles a week on a regular basis for many, many years. Mm. Um, and uh, so my health, I've always been very health conscious. I've maintained a good, healthy weight. And um, so I had some ideas about what health was, and, uh, but it was mostly related to fitness. Uh, and uh, I never had really understood the nutrition component of it. There was a, uh, a funny story where uh, I, I took my girls to uh, Cancun every summer for our summer vacation and uh, uh over there had been this kind of period where i had gained a little bit of weight and i took my shirt off in front of my older girl she was nine at the time uh and, and that the first time she'd seen me shirtless since the previous summer uh when we were at the pool or something and she said daddy you're fluffy uh and i love i love the uh honesty of children you know they're you know they're oh, not, they'll call you out any moment yeah. of any day they're, they're, <laughs> she wasn't trying to be insulting she just noticed that you know, I was 20 or 30 pounds heavier than I had been the previous year. Mm. Uh, and uh, so that kind of got me motivated to get back into shape and not fluffy. <laughs> yeah, not fluffy. And I started doing this thing by uh, Tony Horton called P90X. Oh, no, I love P90X. <laughs> I, I did that faithfully for three years. I just was a nut. Uh, oh. And uh, probably part of my obsessive compulsive personality. But <laughs> one thing that uh, Tony Horton kind of pushed real hard was that he would say that nutrition is 80% of the game. And he, I, I was really surprised that a fitness expert who was in really good shape and doing these really hard workouts was talking about how the workout was only 20% of the deal and, uh, and nutrition was the, uh, the, mo the most important impact. And so that kind of got me thinking about more how important nutrition was. And I did make some changes, but I still was doing kind of a standard American thing. I was doing a high protein uh, low fat diet. So mm. it was a 40% protein, 40% carbohydrate, 20% fat diet. Mm. Uh, and I, you know, even as a physician didn't understand that all of that protein was really going to waste and wasn't helping me because I wasn't some sort of huge person who needed high protein needs or a big time bodybuilder who's building lots of muscle. Mm -hmm. um, I was a very slight guy who uh, was just working out a lot. Mm. But for some reason, I went with that 
that. And so for many years, I went with the kind of the lean meat, mm -hmm. uh, low protein, uh, I, I mean, a high protein, lean meat. Uh, and, but I understood the need for carbs mm -hmm. uh, as an energy source uh, because I didn't think the protein was an energy source, but, uh, mm -hmm. uh, and then the low fat diet. So I was kind of evolving in my processes and, and then also beginning to think about how nutrition was really more important. Uh, but the, the bigger impact was when uh, Maya, my wife, came into my life uh, over a decade ago. She was largely a um, pescatarian uh, mm. at the time, and was, she was always doing a lot of reading and uh, uh, in getting information about health. She's very focused on health. Uh, she might even say at one point she was a hypochondriac, but mm -hmm. uh, you know, that might be the, the uh, basis for her. But there was a, a, a time about seven or eight years ago where she... You know, the funny thing is we, we, we moved into an apartment high rise that was right next to a Whole Foods mm. because we thought that's where we're going to get um, uh, healthy foods. And so I enjoyed the fact that we just walked out the bottom of my high rise and across the street and we were at the, at the Whole Foods because that was awesome. easy to shop there. Yeah. Uh, and uh, she uh, one day said, hey, there's this guy coming to speak at Whole Foods and I want you to come. And I was like, oh, really? What? Who? And she said, it's uh, a fireman named Rip Esselstyn. <laughs> Why would I want to go watch a fireman? And she said, he's going to give a talk on nutrition. I really, she had really lost me there because a fireman <laughs> coming to give a talk on nutrition. Uh, 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 and if, if any of your audience is versed in this, everyone knows who Rip Esselstyn is. But uh, uh, so, uh, but for those of you who don't, his, he, he's uh, part of a family, the Esselstyn family, and his father wrote a book on how to prevent and reverse heart disease which uh, basically was a, uh, a recipe for, uh, for how to work on heart disease from a plant-based standpoint. But anyway, so she took me there and he, he gave a talk, which um, I challenged a lot of my current concepts on atherosclerosis and heart disease. Uh, you know, he was saying things like, you know, you can prevent this from happening and by the way you eat, and you can even reverse this disease by the way you eat. Uh, and I, as a vascular surgeon, I'd never heard that stuff. That wasn't taught to me. Um, and, uh, so I, I was pretty skeptical when I walked out of there because, uh, but it did, uh, I, it did kind of, uh, open my mind to the idea and I did mm -hmm. do some research and that's when I went on to finally read something called the China study, which you're obviously well aware of. And I did go and I did read the book, how to prevent and reverse heart disease. Mm -hmm. And I started to learn about the work of Dean Ornish, uh, mm -hmm. which was done well before my fellowship mm -hmm. in vascular surgery. And yet none of that was presented to me. You know, he, he published some of his uh, work in the Lancet in 1990, I think it was. And mm -hmm. I did my fellowship in 96, 97 and 98. And that stuff wasn't, you know, despite the fact that he was, I think times one times 100 top people of the year or something. And, well-known and, uh, you know, well-recognized for his work, uh, his concepts were not taught to us. So, but, uh, so I started to get exposed to that and, uh, being a scientist, uh, you know, I couldn't, uh, the, the day it was there, uh, the science was there. Uh, and suddenly I realized how important, um, uh, our nutrition is in our overall health, how our, what our diet contributes to chronic disease, especially the chronic diseases that are the risk factors for what I treat, hypertension, diabetes, obesity, hypercholesterolemia, and, uh, uh, and, all, and all of these are preventable to a great extent. Uh, and uh, so uh, it was very hard. I, I couldn't have that cognitive dissonance where I knew the data and, right. but then continued to ignore it. So, um, uh, my wife, when being presented with this information, she went, she became plant-based overnight. Wow. Uh, and, and, you know, she was already most of the way there because at that point she was really only eating fish. Um, uh, but I did, uh, I did make the conscious decision uh, to, to do so. And I made a transition over the course of a few months hmm. uh, to becoming a whole food plant-based. Uh, yeah. And, and there's, there's a backstory to this too, is around that time, I was applying for life insurance. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, 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 as many of you know out there, when you apply for life insurance, especially larger policies, um, they might, they require physical and, and blood work. Uh, and um, I had uh, 
uh, become fully plant-based uh, in uh, sometime in, the, in December. And I had this blood work drawn in February. Uh, and uh, uh, I guess the, the backstory is that uh, my blood pressure, I was kind of pre-hypertensive. My blood pressure was always in the 130s over 80s. Um, I, I was pre-diabetic at the time with a uh, uh, hemoglobin A1C of like 6. Um, and uh, I had a cholesterol, which was in the uh, 220s, 227, something like that. So I was kind of already on my way to being, you know, getting those chronic diseases that you get. Uh, and uh, around around the age of 50, is that, that was when it was, uh, which is then not uncommon for about one in two Americans by the time they're age 50 are on some medication for a chronic disease, whether it's diabetes or hypertension or cholesterol or something. So I was well on my way to being one of those people. And then when I got my blood drawn for the insurance exam in February, uh, and I had my blood pressure done and everything. Funny thing is, here's a doctor around blood pressures every day, but I got my blood pressure tested once every, you know, six years. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, and so I hadn't had my blood pressure tested in a while. And it, my blood pressure was normal. My <laughs> cholesterol was less than 150. My hemoglobin A1C had gone, dropped down to 5.6. Um, and uh, uh, so he, uh, uh, I, and I attribute that those changes. I kind of had my own personal test. I had some tests done from six months before, uh, and those, those tests and, uh, everything had changed. Mm. Uh, you know, so I, I was a believer just on my own personal uh, experience. Wow. So you that's kind of your chronic disease train, huh? Yeah. I, and I've, I've subsequently learned too. I'm, I'm of Southeast Asian descent. I've subsequently learned that I'm, I'm at higher risk for some of these things, uh, mm. uh, cardiac, cardiac, uh, cardiac disease, diabetes, uh, yeah. hypertension, these all very, very much in our, our society. And we're seeing that now in Pakistan and India, as their diet has become more westernized over the last three decades, mm -hmm. there's an explosion in obesity and type two diabetes, as well as heart disease. Mm -hmm. uh, our incidence of heart disease is around 40% in the United States. And I think their incidence is approaching 52%. Wow. Yeah. Holy moly. And so when you say incidents, what does that mean exactly? If you can explain that to the audience. I, I would assume, I, I mean, I, my understanding is that uh, it's the 40% of people in the United States succumb to cardiovascular disease. And I think it's in about 52% there now. Wow. It's, ah, that's very sad. You know, my um, biological father had his first heart attack at 38. Oh, wow. And then my mom's dad died at 46. So like you, I've always been cognizant of my own health and kept a healthy weight and exercise. And we, we, because we didn't have a lot of money growing up, we always had a vegetable garden. We didn't eat a lot of meat because it was expensive. Mm -hmm. And, um, but we had tons of beans and potatoes and vegetables and some fruits. Um, but I don't think we ever had too many nuts except at Christmas to get those in your stocking. <laughs> you crack mm -hmm. two nuts open and be done. But, um, but yeah, no, it's, it's a, it's a frightful thing to think about um, genetically, you know, at a higher predisposition. So then you move someone like that to America or they get a worse Western diet where they're located and nobody talks to them about this type of intervention, right? Right. Well, I think it's just some, it's kind of the, uh, the, the si silent thing that goes on that, that mm. no one wants to talk about, or it's not kosher or um, our lifestyles are in such a way. Uh, that uh, we don't, we kind of box that out, you know, mm. we live, and it is kind of, uh, it's kind of scary. Um, and I've learned, I've kind of started saying this expression, many of us know what the right thing to do is. I mean, there's still people who smoke knowing it's bad for them. Mm. Uh, and I think that uh, uh, most of my patients, if you ask them, they'll tell you that they, they should, the, that their diet is bad, that they mm. eat too much processed food, that they eat too, too much meat. Uh, so it's, uh, 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 so I always, I use this expression, if, if doing the right thing was only, we, if we did the right thing just because we knew what the right thing to do, well, I'm not even saying that right. <laughs> if the only reason to do something the right way was knowing the right thing to do, we'd all do it. But mm -hmm. most of us don't because there's so many other things that impact our choices of mm -hmm. behaviors. Yeah, yeah, the environment. And, you know, being in the heart of Texas, <laughs> I'm curious how do these conversations roll out in your clinic when you do recommend? Yes. I'm so curious to hear. <laughs> uh, you know, I, it's, uh, 
it, I'm only smiling because it's 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 frustrating. But I'm smiling <laughs> out of frustration. Um, I they're not well received, uh, mm -hmm. and I, you know I've got a lot of patients who've been living a certain way for many decades, in their mm -hmm. 60s, 70s, and 80s, and and then when I talk to them about uh, it's uh, about changing their lifestyle, and hey, yeah, you know it's I, I hate to put this I hate to say this to you, but your lifestyle has contributed significantly to you being here. Mm -hmm. and uh to having these problems and uh if you make some changes you can improve your lifestyle mm -hmm. uh and when you start talking about oh it's a, you know primarily about the way you eat that's a very personal thing for many you know for many many reasons and so it's not not often well received uh i would say uh quite honestly about five percent of my patients uh make significant changes based on those conversations but then there, I'm also I'm also at a disadvantage because I'm not a primary care physician who can spend a lot of time with them on these things, and mm -hmm. um, uh, I don't have all those resources in my clinic. Uh, you know, most of our, res our resources are directed towards the interventions to take care of their immediate problems. Mm -hmm. And I do I do think it's a, a little bit ironic that after meeting me just once or twice, they'll let me cut them open. <laughs> okay, they trust me enough uh, uh, to to do that. And, uh, right. uh, and, but the minute I start talking about lifestyle and nutrition, they look at me uh, like crazy, you know, and then they're suddenly, they don't trust me anymore. Isn't that weird? Uh, it's and, amazing. Yeah. So it's, it's, it's an, yeah, the amount of trust that they'll give me and I, and I'm, I'm grateful every day for the trust my patients put in me. Sure. Uh, but, uh, you know, then, then, then that's why I'm smiling. It's because the exact <laughs> opposite happens when I start talking to them about lifestyle. Uh, and so that's a very tough, it's tough, isn't it? And it's a very yeah. personal thing and getting people to uh, make changes is hard. Um, yeah. uh, on that same note is uh, when I did finally make that change uh, a few years ago and I became whole food plant-based. And so I started, there was this, I had this agenda at the hospital. I, I work in a smaller sized hospital and they, there was, it was very clear in the doctor's lunch line that I was eating differently. I mean, people would ask me, Hey, why is that? You know, you're skipping the meat and, you know, uh, uh, and so and it's, it was such a small medical community that uh, uh, became very quickly known that Riz has given up eating meat. Uh, and, uh, you know, that's all they cared about. It's not why. Okay. And I would tell them why. Uh, and, <laughs> you know, for my health, I'm a cardiovascular specialist. And right. I'm telling you these things, the science is there. It shows you this and this and this and this. And if you make these changes, you can have all these improvements, you know, in your hypertension, right. diabetes, and your cholesterol. And, it's proven, you know, it's, we got papers and et cetera. And they didn't care about that. It was just Riz, uh, Riz is quit, you know, not, not eating meat anymore. And, and so I was kind of the crazy doctor, you know, like, oh, look at this crazy guy. He just suddenly, you know, quit eating meat. But the funny thing is, is, uh, you know, it, it was, yeah, it's in jest, but, you know, and, and it wasn't a, a, a mean situation either, but, right, uh, but right. now fast forward several years and it wasn't long before people were looking to me as the healthy doctor. <laughs> Awesome. Uh, yeah. And uh, so uh, I think there's that deep down, there's that recognition. Their initial response was one way, but then when deep down inside, these other physicians also understood uh, that this is a healthier lifestyle. Mm. No, yeah. I, I've been through that very similar journey where people look at you, you're mine and your own plate. You're not <laughs> looking, you're not giving judgment. But the moment you start commenting on my plate of food, and then saying, oh, so you're saying what I'm eating is bad. I'm like, well, let's discuss. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's, um, I'm, I'm happy to just mind my own business. But it's really funny how people can almost be offended by what you're eating. Um, yeah. Well, unfortunately, I think sometimes they take that as it's our personal comment about what they're eating. Even uh, though we're not saying anything. Like, literally, they just, they just verbal. And it's almost, uh, I've had this happen several times actually and you know you can have other people go, oh that looks beautiful I wish I'd have got that you know those those are common comments too but I'm always I was always curious as to if I had been in this opposite position where I saw someone eating like this and wasn't familiar with that way of eating would I have made the same comments I, I would hope not but it's like you know they're like wow that looks great why are you eating this way you tell them and they're like so what I'm eating is you're saying is unhealthy and what am I going to die? And, you know, these are some weird, strange, and you're just like, well, <laughs> well, I mean, um, there, I think, I think some of them might actually believe that it is unhealthy and that oh, we are yeah. going to die. And, and yeah. so, you know, it's, yeah. uh, there may not be any malice in it. And I do try to, 
the the good thing about having been one way a decade ago and being the way I am today is I can still go back a decade and see what my perspective was then mm. and try to say, okay, well, that's where they're coming from. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and so, yeah, it's like, it's like you said, go, go put myself back 10 years. And what would I say about my current day person? You know, mm-hmm. and I might think I was crazy. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And it's funny because when I went to a plant-based diet, I lived in a little town called Rifle, Colorado. And so it's like a town of 12,000 people. And when you're a family practice doctor and you have three kids in high school and you, you get, you get, you know, everybody. Right. And uh-huh. so um, you would go to the grocery store <laughs> and it's funny because you'd see patients all the time and they automatically drawn to what's in, what is in Dr. Marvis's cart? Is she actually eating, you know, doing what she's preaching and boy, if anything kept me on the straight and narrow, not that I wouldn't have <laughs> right. anyways, I was like, this was like public accountability on a daily basis. And um, this is before they had the delivery apps. for eating food. <laughs> right. um, but yeah. No I, no, I agree about the accountability. And it's funny too, because, uh, you know, uh, similarly, when, when we go out to eat, you yeah. know, uh, you know, you think about uh, your choices there and how it impacts what people see. And, but that's actually uh, the kind of the, why the change occurred at the hospitals. Um, I just lived as an example on a daily basis about my choices and people began to respect that. Mm, I love that. And do you have any, you said, you know, 5% of your patients or so are really making dramatic changes or any of those stories that you you could share as to some of the changes that you've seen occur? Yeah. You know, there's, there's, there's one recent one just, you know, kind of coming out of the pandemic that uh, really comes to mind because it speaks to many of the things that we've talked about. First off, he presented at a young age, mm. uh, a 52 year old man uh, with a 90% blockage of one of his carotid arteries. I can't remember which side, but mm. one side was severely blocked. We always check both sides because it can, it can occur. If it's going to, if it occurs in one artery, there's a good chance it's going to occur in another but the other side was pretty okay. Mm-hmm. And it did have some moderate disease, uh, so it wasn't zero. Uh, and so I, you know, I told him that, you know, you've got a very high risk of having a stroke and we're going to have to fix this. Uh, and uh, that involves an operation. I'm going to have to cut him open, go down, physically clean out the plaque. And uh, so, you know, he agreed to have all that done. Uh, but then he, he's the one who actually initiated the conversation by saying, well, hey, doc, uh, this is really scaring me. Um, what can I do uh, to prevent from having to have another problem or to have to have the other side fixed in the future? Because I had told him that there's often, and afterwards we'll monitor you because there's often a chance that the other side will progress. Uh, and, and suddenly I was like, okay, well, here, let me talk to you. And, <laughs> And, uh, you know, uh, whenever I have an interested patient, you know, we, our conversations become much longer. Mm-hmm. And my office staff is oftentimes t- texting me or knocking at the door, uh, you know, you know, you know, you've been in there 30 minutes, uh, it's time for you to get out. Uh, but off, it's hard to drag me out when I have a patient who wants to talk about it. Oh, yeah. And, uh, uh, so we had a very long conversation about uh, lifestyle and, and in particular nutrition. And... Uh, uh, I gave him, I have some resources that I hand out to patients in the office that have to do with uh, the American College of Lifestyle Medicine uh, and then also uh, uh, PCRM because I think they're very good resources for people. Um, and, uh, oh, and, and so, you know, we had a good conversation. Uh, I didn't actually think a lot about it. Uh, you know, I'm fairly busy and I don't, uh, uh, but then the next time I saw him was about a, a month later when we had scheduled to do the procedure and uh, I walked into the pre-op area. The, the, the first meeting was in my office. The next meeting was in the pre-op area at the hospital on the day of the surgery. And I pulled the curtain over uh, and I didn't recognize him. I was like, I th- at first I thought, Oh my, I'm sorry. I, I came into the wrong room. Uh, and he was like, no, no, Dr. Bukhari, you know, you're, this is me. It's me. Cause it, it, it had been about a month, and uh, uh, so he, he he had lost a lot of weight. And so oh. when I sat down and talked to him, he told me he left the office that day. He went straight to the store, did some shopping based on what we talked about, went home, threw out all his bad stuff, looked up all the resources, and was plant-based immediately. Wow. Um, whole food plant-based. And uh, 
uh, and he had lost 20, 25 pounds in a, in just in just a month, yeah. uh, which was fascinating. But there's uh, there's more to the story, and that's why it's, this is interesting to me. Is not only had he lost weight, but uh, you know he uh, he had all, at the time of his visit in the office, he was hypertensive on some medications. Uh, even though he was taking medications, he was hypertensive, and he he had type two diabetes, uh, and his cholesterol was high. And so the other things that I could point to at that at that visit is that his blood pressure was normal at the hospital visit, although he was still taking his blood pressure medications. But at least he wasn't hypertensive like he was when he had been at the uh, office, and his cholesterol was lower than one fifty, <laughs> even though it was high. And he was on, if I can, I can't remember which, but he was on a statin mm. and he was on a statin and it was still high in my office. And now it was below 150, uh, at the time of the operation. So there was some, just in one month, we're talking four week, four or five weeks here. Uh, uh, the guy had lost weight, his blood pressure had normalized and his cholesterol was less than 150. So he, you know, in the subsequent, you know, I did, we did his operation. He did well. And, uh, in subsequent times. He has, uh, uh, what's the term when you take him off of med? Deep prescribed. Deep prescribed. Right? Yeah. yeah. Uh, he has deep prescribed. Uh, I, I wasn't responsible for doing that because I'm not his primary care doctor, but we worked and he, uh, I don't think he's uh, diabetic anymore. Mm. Uh, I, I can't remember if he's just on one medication for his hypertension. His cholesterol is normal. So the, uh, you know, these, he, he's dramatically impacted all of the risk factors that uh, got him to where he it was for mm. needing an operation. Uh, so he's done, in my opinion, what he needs to do to uh, live a longer, healthier life. So that was, a, in my opinion, that's one of my w more recent great stories. Mm. And he won't have to come back and utilize your surgical services <laughs> because of he won't progress, yeah. right? We're going to keep an eye on him. Sure. Uh, but, uh, you know, uh, my, my active patients, sometimes I'm seeing them every three months and I might operate two, three times a year on them. Wow. Uh, what I'm hoping is that, you know, over time, I see him less and less often, you know, mm -hmm. as, as he proves to me that uh, our studies show that he doesn't have any recurrent disease coming on. Right. Wow. That's amazing. So can we get to, you said he presented, can we describe, I'd like for people just an education on what are the symptoms of someone who's having vascular disease in different areas? Because you said he hadn't had a stroke yet. Like, what does yeah. that look like? Was it a doctor finding a brewery or what's going on in the legs? Things like that. Yeah. In this particular case, he was very fortunate. Uh, it was a, his primary care physician actually put a stethoscope to his neck uh, and heard a brewery and then sent him for a carotid ultrasound, which showed the disease. So we, we uh, were treating more and more asymptomatic disease these days. than back in the old days, my dad's days, we actually just waited till someone had a stroke. Okay. You had a stroke. Okay. Let's now let's fix your carotid artery. Mm. Uh, and Lord knows that 50% uh, of the time, the first stroke is the big one. And so uh, that's not a great way. Now, fortunately, we have ways to detect disease ahead of time now uh, and a high uh, level of recognition. So we're tre we treat a lot of asymptomatic disease because the studies show that once you reach a certain point, uh, fixing it uh, does prevent strokes. Uh, but, uh, you know, the in a... Uh, I, I alluded to earlier that the the artery supplies a certain area of the body, and that area of the body is what's affected by the disease. So if you have, and I don't treat the heart, but if you have atherosclerosis in your coronary arteries, uh, then that can cause heart attacks or even death, okay? Chest pain is a, one of the symptoms that people have, uh, but it's not the only symptom. People can have feel like just fatigue, or they can feel chest pressure, or they can feel shortness of breath. They can feel pain radiating to their left arm or their shoulder, pain radiating to their neck. Um, so uh, then uh, for the carotid arteries, which is a, a very, another common area I treat, uh, TIAs, which are called transient ischemic attacks, are a very common way people present. And that's a mini stroke in the sense that it's something that where they have some sort of deficit, facial droop, slurred speech, numbness in their fingers, or, or weakness in their arm or hand, uh, and, but that goes away very quickly. They usually recover within uh, a few minutes to a couple of hours. And that's what's called a TIA. And that's a bad sign. That's a harbinger of a possible stroke in the future. Uh, and so that's one way people present. Another way people present was actually having a stroke. 
and uh, uh, so what they'll do is they'll uh, have a blockage in the carotid artery, and then blood clots form on it. They break off and go to the brain and cause strokes. And the the type of stroke you have, whether it's your speech or movement or sensation, depends on what part of the brain that blood clot goes to or that plaque. So those are that's the way uh, strokes present. Uh, and then for uh, the the thing that I treat the most is lower extremity disease. Uh, and most one of the, some of the most common presentations are foot wounds, uh, non-healing foot wounds. You know, for people with normal circulation who don't have you know diabetes, if you get a cut or a scratch, a bug bite, whatever, those typically heal on their own without much care. Uh, but people who have non-healing wounds um, uh, present with a concern. You know, often that's that's a sign for us to. Uh, look into whether they have diabetes or do they have peripheral arterial disease or, or atherosclerosis. Uh, and so wounds are, is one way. Uh, people uh, can present with uh, something called claudication. And claudication is pain in the legs, which is similar to chest pain. When you have blockages in the coronary arteries, you can get chest pain with exertion. Well, in the legs, if you get leg pain with exertion, that's called claudication uh, or vascular angina of the legs. And that's a presentation for people who have blockages. So there's a progression of symptoms that can occur as the blockages get worse. At first, there's no symptoms um, when they're not bad. And then you start to have symptoms with exertion. Uh, and then you might have symptoms at rest. Uh, and then, or you might develop wounds. So those are some of the, some of the symptoms. Um, there's something that I talk about that's uh, not very well known, but impotence in men is, can be a very, a uh, significant sign of atherosclerosis. Uh, they say about 40% of men, I use the, I quote these numbers because it's easy. 40% of men in their 40s, 50% in their 50s, and 60% of men in their 60s have some form of impotence. And uh, oftentimes that impotence has to do with a problem or, or lack of blood flow. And so uh, impotence can be a sign that you have atherosclerosis going on. Mm, kind of the so. canary in the coal mine. Yes, yeah. a, a harbinger. I, I call it the harbinger. Yeah. 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 I, I was going to say, if you didn't mention the impotence, the ED piece, because that can also be a motivator for some of our male patients, for sure. Yeah. Of all um, things, right? Yeah. It, whatever works. <laughs> whatever works. I, I, I'm happy to go to the more, you know, uh, caveman, whatever movement, whatever, whatever. It's all good. Whatever. No, what, we got to find the right works. motivator. Yeah. Exactly. What's, um, uh, you know, what's your why, right? Exactly, exactly. And, but it is an important piece of, of relationships and stuff. So absolutely. But I, I'm curious because that happens so quickly, right? Because I, I certainly know that the, some of the patients that I have spoken about in ED improves really quite, quite quickly, at least in some of the patients I've moved to a plant-based diet, they're like, by the way, you know, mm. things are happening. I'm like, well, okay, good job. Um, well, but, you uh, know, yeah. you know, how I can speak to that is that, yeah. um, you know, I, I think when, when we have people with disease, yeah, uh, and there's there's this kind of this, and this has to do with flow dynamics uh, and hemodynamics, so in the way blood flows. As you got an, uh, the lumen that's narrowing and narrowing and narrowing, there comes a critical point where suddenly there's not enough flow, uh, and impotence occurs. Okay, and so all you have to do is reverse that disease just a little and you've gotten them back to that point where there's enough flow. Mm -hmm. So uh, you're, not necessarily, you're not necessarily reversing all of the disease, mm -hmm. but you're reversing it enough and doing enough uh, that it makes an impact. But there, it's multifactorial with ED. Mm -hmm. um, it has to do with vasodilatation, uh, healthier arteries, less oil causing stiffening. So there's, mm -hmm. I mean, but also maybe you are reducing the atherosclerotic burden just enough, mm -hmm. two or three or four or 5%. Mm -hmm. uh, to, and you put all those things together and, uh, and you've got better function. Yeah. And I think it comes along with that is the psychological impact, um, as well, because sometimes if there is an issue that the psychological concern and the, the emotional aspect can make it even harder. Oh, no doubt. You put, I mean, you put that on top of a physical ailment yeah. and it's a double whammy, right? Yeah. So yeah. Certainly. And then if there's medications that are causing it, um, if you improve blood pressure, maybe you don't need that beta blocker anymore right. or some of the other medications, that also helps. So like you said, it is multifactorial, um, but it, it is, it's always a, 
it's not something that's the first thing I would speak to about patients. So but it's always fun when they come back and they're just like suddenly very delighted. And I'm like, <laughs> and it's just fun conversations. <laughs> yeah. It's interesting if they make the connection. Yes. Uh, it does. It yeah. does remind me. It does remind me of the, uh, in when I first thought soft forks over knives, I was blown away. Mm. Uh, you know, when they were talking about you know, addressing three major issues, but there was a myriad of other secondary issues that went away. Right. Right. And so right. you're not, oftentimes you're probably not talking about ED when mm -hmm. you're addressing their issues, but that's just one of the other things that can improve. Right. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. No, Forks Over Knives is, was such a wonderful, it's such a wonderful documentary and it's, but I think it came out in 2011, still refer patients to go and watch. Oh yeah. Uh, Forks Over Knives. It's, it's, it's fabulous. Absolutely. Wonderful. Oh my goodness. That's great. Well, goodness, I've taken up almost an hour of your time or over an hour now. Um, where can people find you and learn more about you? Because you do some other cool stuff. Please share. Well, uh, so my wife, Maya, and I, Maya Acosta, and I um, uh, do do our, you know, we, uh, we teach this stuff to my patients, but we also have wanted to increase our reach, our outreach. And one of my, my particular goals was, uh, you know, how, how, I want to get to people earlier on in life mm. uh, and teach them a better way to live so that they don't end up on my table. Uh, my operating table. And I, in a sense, I joke that I'm trying to put myself out of business. Mm -hmm. And if that were true, and if it happens, that's great. I'll find something else to do. I'll, mm -hmm. I'll retire and, and I'll uh, ride off into the sunset. Um, <laughs> uh, but, uh, you know, so we do, we do a lot of outreach. Um, and uh, we, at pre pandemic, we were quite active with uh, potlucks, movie screenings, guest speakers. Um, I do a week, a monthly walk with the doc. Uh, which I work with the national organization called Walk with the Duck. And so these are a lot of the things that we did do. And then the pandemic hit and we kind of slowed down, we did a lot of Zoom ba based activities. I kind of used to joke during the pandemic that I was all Zoomed out because <laughs> we were doing so much Zoom stuff. And yeah. now I call it now in post pandemic era uh, uh, is that we're starting to become more active again. But um, oh, uh, we, uh, we have a website and, and, uh, it was originally plantbaseddfw.com, and we are since we're reaching out beyond Dallas Fort Worth, uh, we're rebranding as healthylifestylesolutions.org. Mm. Uh, I just want to make sure people were aware of that. So healthylifestylesolutions.org is our website that actually has links to all of our social media, all of our resources, all of the things that we're doing. Uh, but uh, um, I would like to specifically point out my Instagram is, you know, probably my social media where I'm most active and that's dr underscore Riz, R-I-Z underscore Bukhari uh, is my Instagram. Uh, and then uh, uh, Maya, my wife has a, a very well-respected podcast in the, in the uh, lifestyle community and that's Healthy Lifestyle Solutions. Um, so I would encourage people to do, uh, go check that out. I'm a, I, the funny story there with that is that we started that together uh, back in uh, uh, 2018, uh, and uh, uh, so we were co-hosts, but I was very busy with my professional work in, in, uh, as a vascular surgeon, so she'd always have to be dragging me and finding me, finding time to help interview guests and do things, and so finally she just kicked me out, as, and so I was no longer a co-host, and she's you know, uh, rebranded and taken over. Uh, and done much, much better work with it. And so now I'm back on as a guest. Uh, and so I do do guests, uh, several guest segments a month. Uh, and we talk about um, specific healthcare related issues and, and uh, how to uh, improve your lifestyle uh, with those things. We've talked about uh, hypertension uh, and we've talked about diabetes and uh, we'll do, we do multiple segments on that. So I would encourage you to check that out. Uh, and then lastly, I do have a guide to cardiovascular nutrition, uh, which it's a PDF, which you can download. And uh, uh, I'm going to give you the, the link for that. And it's bit.ly yes. forward slash join Dr. Riz. So, awesome. Uh, and so it's to... a bit.ly uh, forward slash Dr. Riz. So we'll put the links to all of those, please um, send those to me if we haven't. Jonathan Absolutely. will put those in the show notes. And um, yeah, Maya's podcast is great. And I was a guest on it um, a month or so ago. So that was, that's fantastic. She's a lovely host. And um, yeah, I, I can imagine it'd be really fun to have a, a resident expert to just like, hey, 
need to come on. Let's talk about this. <laughs> yeah, you know, it's That's not awesome. as easy as it would seem uh, because uh, we're we're both very busy, but busy, uh, we do find yeah. time to uh, uh, record those episodes. Yeah. Awesome. No, that's fantastic. Well, thank you again for taking the time to to come on. And um, I'm I know we're going to be working uh, closely together in the future, and those will be some fun things to share as that grows. And yeah, so thanks so much for your work that you're doing, and I think it's fabulous that you're a subspecialist like you are and taking the time to change people's lives when you didn't have to. That's well, great. thank you. I mean, it, it did, it has kind of rejuvenated my spirit uh, yeah. and my faith in medicine as a, as a healer uh, mm. and, you know, trying to get us back to what we should be doing and not waiting for disease to happen, but trying to teach people how not to get sick. You know, oh, uh, I want to, I want to thank you for what you're doing and I've enjoyed being here and, I look forward to all the great work that, uh, seeing all the great work that you're doing and come to fruition. Oh, thank you very much. Yeah, it's, uh, it'll be my last startup. And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> a lot of work, huh? Yeah, I am getting too old for, um, yeah. <laughs> it's well worth it, but I, I totally appreciate, you know, when you, when you do something like this or anything, you take any undertaking, it doesn't matter, medical school or becoming a parent even, it just gives you a new perspective on people who build businesses like the grocery store that you go to all those products on those shelves the store itself the car that drove you there the house you live in the board I mean it's just like overwhelming to think those are businesses that someone had an idea put the time and resources in to build so you could have access to it and uh, it's just amazing to me humans are incredible so um yeah so it's a fun thinking meditation and mindful of everything that we have we're very fortunate here so um but yes thank you again for your time and expertise and everyone listen please share this with a lot of people i think this is some valuable information and i'd, I'd be tickled to hear this that you're you're sharing your story here um, also change lives of people you don't even know so i think that's that's so much fun so thank, thank you, you again much. you're welcome Thanks for watching, and I hope you enjoyed that video. Before you go though, please hit the subscribe and alert buttons so you don't miss out on any of the amazing content we're working so hard to provide you. We upload a new episode of Health & Mora with Dr. Lori Marbus every Friday. Now, if you'd rather listen to the podcast, you can find us on all the major platforms such as iTunes, Google Play, SoundCloud, and even Spotify. If you're looking for amazing resources to help you start and sustain a plant-based diet, exercise, recipes, or anything wellness, we got you covered there too. Because at Mora, we actually provide physician-led support groups to help people live happier, healthier lives free of metabolic disease. Don't forget to check out our website at mora.com. And thanks again for watching.